This is the Extra Point Podcast. During this podcast, we will dive deeper into our Sunday teaching and share practical next steps for your faith journey. Now, let's kick off the Extra Point. Hey, welcome to the Extra Point. I'm Cheryl Ross, the Next Steps and Discipleship Pastor here at Southridge Church. And I'm with Scott Beha, our lead pastor. And before we go any further, I just want to make sure to remind you, if you have not liked or subscribed to this podcast, be sure to do so so you don't miss out on any new content. This Sunday, we kick off a brand new series that we've done regularly throughout the past. This is called Asking for a Friend. Pastor Scott, just share with us briefly um, about what the series is about and what we can hope to get from it. So the Asking for a Friend series used to be called You Asked for It. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's essentially where we just take a pause in our calendar to answer questions that people in our congregation um, have. Um, just because sometimes churches can be places where questions are kind of stifled or where people feel embarrassed about asking questions or, um, they, you know, whatever it may be. Maybe they just have a fear of asking questions. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I always kind of had this like fear of asking questions at church because I was like, if it, if it felt too personal, I felt like someone would try to like pry into my business yeah. or whatnot. And so, um, I think the church though should be the safest place to ask questions, to wrestle with stuff. And so due to the nature of that, we do handle from time to time some topics that make people a little fussy or make them a little mm-hmm. frustrated or concern them a bit with, um, how we handle them. Um, but I think that if we understand the purpose behind the series, then it's it's easy to... And, and sometimes you may have to sit through the answer to a question um, of, you know, that you don't really care about, right. which is, is my fear um, for this past week, is yeah. that honestly, the vast majority of people um, just don't care. Because mm-hmm. they just go... Like, I, and when I say don't care, I don't mean like, you know, in a bad way i mean they're just like yeah it's whatever like yeah y'all let women preach that's great yeah we just don't we like this church yeah right so most people don't care in that sense they get Mm -hmm. like oh i didn't even know this was an issue right um meanwhile like the church at large is like fighting in the media about it right Mm -hmm. now because of all the stuff that's been going on with the southern baptist convention there's some like animal that wants to join (laughs) us um and that whatever it's summer so that's that's the series it's 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 one of my favorite series to do even though it, it normally requires a ton of work mm-hmm. it can be my least favorite series because it's the one i normally get fussed at the most about right <laughs> as well um so that's what we can expect um this week i actually changed the, for, the, for the sunday coming up i changed the question um because we were going to do like three maybe like really highly um heady questions mm-hmm. and i thought that's not going to play very well Right. Um, so I changed it to more of a heart question for this week. Mm-hmm. Um, so the way it'll feel more, maybe not like you're sitting through a college lecture. Right. Um, because what we're going to do in the third week of this is someone asked about the canonization of the Bible, which I think is a really, yeah. really great question for people, mm-hmm. especially because there's really bad information out there about it. Yeah. And so I think just to arm people with the information about why we believe the Bible is credible mm-hmm. in the first place is really helpful. But this, um, yeah, that's what you can kind of expect in um, this series is, um, you know, in the final week, I'm going to answer as many questions as I possibly can that have already been submitted. I just got a bunch of really good questions, but that, like, they wouldn't necessarily need a full mm-hmm. Sunday, or I've already done something on them. Yeah. So there's no reason to really, like, go back. Like, for instance, the reason why I changed this week's question was somebody asked about the Big Bang Theory. Mm-hmm. And while, like in Genesis 1, if the sun didn't get created till, um, gosh, my mind's going blank, day um, two or three, whatever it is. Yeah. I don't know. It may even have been later. My, my mind is, yeah. like, all over the place right now. But how other things could happen before the sun, because we know scientifically speaking that the sun is. And, and the problem with, like, that question is 
we have been like in, in response to the enlightenment enlightenment period where postmodernism came out and we just questioned everything mm-hmm. what some people in the church did is they introduced the radical fundamental way of looking at the scriptures and said oh no no as the response to you questioning everything we're not going to double down on the inerrancy and everything and demand that this thing be read as literal as humanly possible when If you know anything about ancient Near Eastern literature, like Genesis 1, you don't have to read that as a... I don't think it's trying to be a science textbook. Right. That's why it doesn't matter at what what day they said the sun was created, Mm -hmm. because really the the idea behind Genesis 1 is there is a benevolent creator behind everything, Mm -hmm. which is different than all the other creation narratives of the ancient Near East. Right? So I didn't need to... I covered that in a Genesis series last year, so I don't really need to do a whole week on that plus it's just kind of intuitive if you can know the right way to read the bible right. and you don't end up getting those weird questions like well how did the sun come on this day but there was this before that and it's like right well because we've been taught by by like hard-nosed fundamentalists that, that that's a question that has to be answered and if you can't and what happens is if you can't square that with the bible then you'll either go one of two ways you'll you'll make a mockery of science and look like a fool or you'll go the way of atheism and you're like, oh, well, there's problems with the Bible because yeah. the sun showed up later than this or whatever. And he goes, no, that's not really, that, that's not really how the church has handled this, um, you know, before this, like, massive reaction to the Enlightenment period. So, like, yeah. just, that, but it didn't need a whole week. Yeah. I digress. So, there, I answered that question <laughs> um, for, for whoever yeah. had that. And I'll probably hit it again in yeah. that last that final week, because I'm just going to answer those quick questions like that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that, you know, something that you said from this past Sunday that we can remember throughout is that whenever we answer certain questions, we're not necessarily, we're not trying to change people's minds or like sway you one way or another. We're trying to give you, you know, answer the question based on scripture, give you the best information that we can give you. Yeah. And at the end of the day, like this topic that you covered on Sunday is not something that like we need to really get up in arms about. No. Um, so the, the question was, what scriptures can we use to support female pastors and leaders in the church? Yeah. And there are two main views. You've got complementarian, which I always remember it because it has the word men in it, that um, they are not affirming of women teaching and leading in the church. So they're more pro men, right? And then egalitarian. So it has the word gal in it. They are affirming of women teaching and leading in the church. Um, Obviously, as you said, like we have female pastors and preachers. Mm -hmm. I am one of them. Um, But what is it that you think makes it really hard for, for a lot of people to get behind the egalitarian view? I think the hardest part for most people and I'm not talking like scholarly speaking that they mm-hmm. will take it a totally different way. Mm-hmm. But I mean, just your average churchgoer, um, the thing that stands in the way would be First Timothy chapter two. Mm-hmm. It's just that passage they read it and they go, "Oh, well, that's just that's just what it is." Yeah. And I, I, like I know, like I was talking to someone recently, they go, "Like, well, I just I just go with whatever Paul says," and he made it pretty clear in First Timothy two that they can't do it. And I go, "Yeah, but the only problem with that is everything else that Paul said." Mm-hmm. Right, like the only problem with saying, "Well, Paul said it, so that settles it," is everything else that Paul said. Mm-hmm. Or if you want to go the way of like, "Well, God wrote, God, God, you know, God inspired it." Well, the only problem is everything else God said on the topic, mm-hmm. like uh, every other example that we have. That's yeah. the problem with that view. But like, so many people just come to it and they go, "Well, that's what it means," mm-hmm. and it's like, but that's not how we actually. We don't ever just study the the Bible in a vacuum, like where we're not influenced by other things whatsoever. Like right. all of us, whether we want to admit it or not, have presuppositions when it comes to yeah. um, the Bible and, and such. So like whatever you were raised with, mm-hmm. whatever you heard first, or maybe someone that you highly respect in your life, mm-hmm. maybe it was your pastor, maybe it was your parents, mm-hmm. told you it was this way. So when you come to read it, when you come to study it, you're unconvinced by the arguments of the other side. Right. And, and and that's, again, that is for both sides of this. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I've been listening to uh, Mike Winger mm-hmm. at BibleThinker.com. He has a great podcast. He has done an unbelievable amount of work on this, more oh, yeah. work than I would ever do in a lifetime on this topic. Oh, yeah. And he came in as a complementarian, like a soft complementarian, 
hoping to be changed to an egalitarian, but he is unconvinced by the arguments of the egalitarians. Now, as I've listened to that, I go, you know what, I actually agree with you a lot um, in that some of the arguments of the egalitarians are super weak Mm -hmm. or super, like, circumstantial Mm -hmm. and such. And so I actually agree with him. And so I see why he hasn't been converted over in that sense. And for me, like you said, like, I'm not really trying to change people's minds anymore. This was, like, maybe six or seven years ago when I started this, I felt like... I'm going to go out and like just stick it to everybody with all this new information that I have. But that's not really what I think what I want m- now more than anything is like if you disagree with us on this topic, that you can at least respect the fact mm-hmm. that we are coming at it from the scriptures. Yes. I am not trying to make a decision about this apart from the scriptures, mm-hmm. not coming at it from another book mm-hmm. or like anything like that. But I am making my inferences on this topic from the scriptures. Yeah. And so at the very, like, because there is a, there's, there's a portion of the complementarian camp that is so complementarian that they would consider us not even Christians. They wouldn't even right. consider us brothers and sisters for, for our egalitarian views yeah. on this. And I go, well, wait a second. That's, that's just way out of bounds, man. Right. Like that's, there's nowhere in the scriptures that go, hey, yeah. you were only saved by how you feel about women in ministry. Like that's that's just right. a nonsensical way of looking at the topic. So I think yeah. now more than anything, it's like, hey, what I want to do is just present to you why I interpret these things this way, mm-hmm. show you from the scriptures. So at the very least, you can understand I value the scriptures mm-hmm. as much as any complementarian out there. I value the scriptures. Um, I believe that they are inspired. I believe that they are um, inerrant in what they sp- seek to teach. Mm-hmm. All of this stuff that, uh, but I also value the role of reading things in context. Yeah. And really doing the hard work of exegesis of what does that mean to the original audience mm-hmm. and what does it also now mean to us because. To read letters written to a specific audience as if they were not written to that audience and to not take that audience and what was going on in that area into, like, to, to neglect that. No, you, the complementarians don't do that in any other passages. Right. Right? They, 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 if you were to ask them to go and exegete, some other passage that didn't have to do with that, they would say, well, mm-hmm. well, let's go look at the cultural context. Let's go look at what's going on in this. What was Paul's mm-hmm. reason for this letter? Yada, yada, yada. They would do yeah. all of this stuff that we are doing with this topic. But yeah. again, we can't get away from our presuppositions. Mm-hmm. Again, which is probably why I've never been converted over to complementarianism, even though I have much more of a heart for that camp now than I probably did six or seven years ago. I still find myself unconvinced but it's also because that's kind of my presupposition, which I just, mm-hmm. I know that about myself. Um, and so I think if we all just be more honest mm-hmm. with like, hey, this is, this is yeah. kind of how we want it to be. And so this is yeah. how we're going to read it to be. Right. If we could just be honest about that, then we could just find a lot more love and respect across mm-hmm. the, really any um, discussion we have in the church. Mm-hmm. Um, if we would stop acting like, hey, you must have got that from a different book. And it's like, no, yeah. we're getting that from this book. We're, we're still on the same team. I'm not saying that's the, the case with every single issue. Right. Um, as there are some issues people take that I think would mm-hmm. put them outside of Orthodox Christianity. Mm-hmm. I don't think this is one of them. Yeah. The church hasn't settled this in 2,000 years of talking about it. Mm-hmm. I, so I don't think that we should see this as a primary salvation mm-hmm. issue. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, like, the mutual respect thing I th- is really the key here. Like, I, I have, you know, my in-laws... They don't believe in what I do, no. and that's fine. Like, as long as they can respect me still and not yep. talk bad about what I do with my kids, like, I'm okay with whatever you believe um, as long as it doesn't go against something totally, you know, that Jesus, like, if they were to say Jesus was not born of a virgin, like, I'd have an issue with that. Yeah. Like, um, But, you know, with this, I'm like, okay, but most of the people who tell me about this, they do say that. They say, this is how I was raised. This is what my parents believed. Yeah. So that's what I believe. Or this is what I was taught growing up. So that's what I believe. It's it's those things. It's those presuppositions that they come yeah. into it with, um, and and it's it's realizing that I think. I think what's interesting to me too, though, uh, that you were just talking about people that kind of disagree mm-hmm. on this is like how stringent they are 
about what the Bible has to say about women in ministry in one passage, mm-hmm. while at the same time, when they interact with people that disagree with them, how they, mm-hmm. how they will just completely neglect, like, love your neighbor as yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, clothe yourself yeah. with compassion. Like, all these other, yeah. everything that has to, okay, you can have your point, but at the point that you start sinning while making your mm-hmm. point, then what good yeah. is your point in the first place? Yeah. And, and that's the problem with a lot of, like, discussion where people disagree. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, you can have your opinion, but at the minute that you start sinning in your opinion mm-hmm. by, like, not loving me the yeah. way that you should love me, by not honoring me and respecting yeah. me and showing yeah. compassion and patience and gentleness, yeah. the minute that you no longer have the character of Christ mm-hmm. when you take your stance, yeah. you are now undermining what, what it is that you were trying to say in the first place. Yeah. And that, that's always funny to me that people would be, like, so staunch about well, this yeah. is what the Word says. It's like, yeah, but don't forget everything else that it said. Mm-hmm. Like, you can have your opinion, yeah. but you need to come at it with a lot of love and respect for that other person. Yeah, and I think that's what, like, I have a good friend who was in my group for a season who she asked me about it. Like, and she was really nervous to bring it up to me because she was afraid I was going to get really offended or upset or like kick her out of my group or, or whatever. And I like, she was surprised at the way that I responded to her and like, we have a love and mutual respect for each other that like, I think it's stronger because of that than what we would have had she just try to keep quiet and those types of things. Um, But what I've seen is that typically whenever you can't have that mutual respect to you, those same people will come to me and ask me for godly advice, will ask me for prayer and those types of things. And I'm just like, okay, you're kind of using me in a pastoral sense in this way. Don't you understand? But it doesn't bother, like it doesn't bother me because at the end of the day, like I know, I know what God's called me to. And I'm convinced and confident in that to where like, it does not matter if you believe a little different in that doesn't matter to me because I am here to please God and yeah. not man. And well, what so, you just mentioned, right there, like everyone's a little bit of a hypocrite. Yeah. Like when they're like, oh, we don't believe in female pastors, but then we'll use you in a pastoral mm-hmm. role. It's like cessationist or cessationist until someone they know is sick. And then all of a, you know, all of a sudden they're praying for healing. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, it, well, and it's the same thing. Like I love, um, and again, again, this is something I, like Calvinists will say, everyone becomes Calvinist whenever they're praying for people to get saved. Because that's exactly what Calvinists believe. Oh, Lord, would you save so-and-so? Well, mm-hmm. that's a very Calvinist prayer, by the way. Again, we're all a little bit of hypocrites. When we take these, like, lines in the sand, mm-hmm. like, given the opportunity, like, for it to be come close to home for us, mm-hmm. we, we kind of have that tendency to, like, yeah. start blurring the lines of what we actually mm-hmm. um, believe. Um, but this topic of women in ministry has changed so much for me. Like, again, I started mm-hmm. all this six or seven years ago, and I would have just been, like, on a, you know, crusade mm-hmm. to, like, convert everyone to my way of thinking. And now I actually think a lot of the egalitarian arguments that I heard originally, I do actually find them to be pretty weak. Mm-hmm. And so I've actually changed the way that I even argue this. Mm-hmm. And I would love for someone to kind of come back and combat me on this, mm-hmm. but, like, my new question is, if we're going to take First Timothy 2, which is kind of the keystone passage for complementarianism, mm-hmm. can you show me that throughout the whole of Scripture? Right. And I know some, some way you say, well, since when did that become the standard of, you know, but the, the, that has always been the standard. Mm-hmm. The things that we hold near and dear are evident throughout all of yeah. the Scriptures. Let's say, like Jesus' virgin birth. Old Testament, it's there. Mm-hmm. New Testament, it's there. Yeah. Now, what happens is, I think a lot of complementarians, you asked one of the reasons why people are more um, fearful of, of changing their opinion on this to the egalitarian is, and, and this will bring up a hot-button topic for a minute, but they are most, most of them are afraid that it ushers in an open door for ideology from like the LGBTQ-type uh-huh. conversations and things like that because they go, well, if this is going to be seen as cultural, that's always been the um, argument of the, you know, of the LGBTQ affirming churches is that, oh, what Paul said about this has been cultural. And so they're afraid that when you start saying that First Timothy 2 is cultural, that they're, but the problem with that argument is what God has to say about sexuality is consistent throughout all yeah. of the scriptures. 
what he says about the role of women leading in scriptures is not represented in First Timothy 2 and then throughout the whole. Right. So this whole fear that, like, hey, if you let women start preaching, then you're going to go the way of these more liberal mm-hmm. theological churches. That's not the case right. whatsoever be- because, again, for me, uh, like, mm-hmm. this is where the change has been. All I'm asking is show it to me throughout the whole Mm -hmm. of Scripture. Just like we we believe that we are saved by faith through grace, Mm -hmm. not by works. Now, most people would say, oh, but that's only found in the New Testament. That's not actually true. We see salvation by God's grace Mm -hmm. through people acting in faith, Mm -hmm. like throughout all of the Old Testament and the like everything that we hold near and dear mm-hmm. in the Christian world, as far as our beliefs go, is represented throughout the whole of Scripture. Yeah. And that, for me, there's not one single egalitarian argument on its own that I find super convincing. But now, what has been most convincing is this is not represented throughout all of the mm-hmm. Scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, you, you spoke on it about how, like, we don't see anywhere in the Old Testament that women were excluded. From leadership or speaking on behalf of God. You've got Deborah, you've got prophetesses, you've got that happening throughout the Old Testament where Deborah, in fact, was a judge who led all of Israel. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that included the men. Like, she led the army. Like, so, I mean, obviously, she led men as well. It was the Um, highest office in the land. Yeah. And I know, now now here's what happens is people that disagree with us on this, Uh the complementarians go, that's a civic issue. Mm-hmm. That's a civic position. So we don't mind women in politics. We don't mind women mm-hmm. CEOs. Mm-hmm. It, they just go, but in God's church, it's just not supposed to be like that. And I go, I mean, if that's the stance you want to take, so they can lead a country, they can lead the world. Mm-hmm. They can't lead in God's, like, I just, that doesn't compute for me yeah. whatsoever to say, oh, that's a civil issue and the, the fact of the matter is it's not right because not there was not this divide in israel like like there is for us you mm-hmm. know like we have a divide of church and state yeah that in was israel never this that was never the case for everything was spiritual for mm-hmm. israel everything was it yeah. wasn't compartmentalized whatsoever yeah. and so, the judges like the holy spirit would come upon them yes for them to do the work yeah so and there so, was not this divide between mm-hmm. sacred and secular in mm-hmm. hebrew society so to say oh well that was civil mm-hmm. that's not the case yeah. all of that ran together because the, what the judges as they would lead they were they were referring to god's law in how they would yeah. lead the nation so it there wasn't this divide there and so again you go so you've got that um you've got deborah you've got prophetesses, you've got mm-hmm. Miriam, you've got Huldah, you've got um, Athaliah, which was the queen in 1 Kings, uh, or 2 Kings, whatever that text is that I have. I want to say. Sorry. Uh, 2 Kings 11. Yeah. Even though that was a weird, again, you go to 2 Kings, yeah. it's a weird story. Like She kind of usurped power because of her son being too young and all that. But yeah. it, either way, it, it happened. God allowed that to happen. And, and so what I would say, even when we come to the New Testament, I gave lots of passages that were that egalitarians go, these are our reasons why we believe what we believe. Mm-hmm. Even if you are unconvinced by them, I still think there's enough evidence for you to at least land in, land in a soft complementarian position mm-hmm. rather than this rigid, strong one. Because like, there, there are complementarian camps that literally, like, you can't sing, you can't speak, period. Yeah. And it goes, well... I don't, that's, that right there is dangerous. Mm -hmm. That right there is, is uncalled for. That's not Mm -hmm. represented in the scriptures. So by the amount of text that, that I would point to when I do this, at the very least, I feel like you should end up in a soft compliment. Mm -hmm. Like I know like uh, J.D. Greer um, at Summit Church Mm -hmm. down North Carolina, he was preaching um, from um, Judges um, in a series a while back, he got to the story about Deborah. And for him, he goes, listen, there's one office in all of the church that, that a lady cannot hold. It's the, the office of the elder, the lead pastor of the church. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, I would, I would approve of, you know, on and on. Okay, that's a very soft complementarian position. Mm-hmm. I can be fine with that if that's how you're going to read. The, but you can, you can see that it's okay for, her, for there to be female staff members, let them teach. Let them lead. Okay, I, 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 
At the very least, I feel like that's where you should land if you're not going to come to the egalitarian side. This whole like side over here that goes like you're not even a Christian right. if you're egalitarian yeah. and all that, it goes like there, there's just no there's just nothing in scripture mm-hmm. that would like I understand people that wind up in the soft complementarian position because mm-hmm. they just can't get over yeah. First Timothy two, they can't get over the elder qualifications all be ri- all being written to a masculine type mm-hmm. um, figure. Mm-hmm. I get that totally, but again, I just go like culturally speaking. Of course, they would write that because the men were going to be the yeah. leaders well, because it was the patriarchal society. Like they weren't going to yeah, write think, gender inclusive language <laughs> to yeah. a first century document. And I think who was it that wrote um, "Is God a Moral Monster"? Like I feel like he oh, covered Paul that Copen, in the Old yeah. Testament some of how like. It says this stuff to men, and it's like it doesn't mean that the same is not true for women. Yeah, there just like, wasn't gender inclusive language like being yeah, used at like, this time. Yeah, period. if a man can't, you know, do these certain things that are immoral, like obviously it means that for women too. Like, um, and I think that was one of those things that I was like, oh, that makes sense, because um, yeah. I had wondered that too. Like when I was reading some of the Old Testament stuff, I was like, why is it all saying this all this stuff about men, like? I think that would apply to a female. And when I read through that, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but I think also um, the, the, the point about context is obviously hugely important. And I think you talk about that over and over again as you um, speak on Scripture. But um, the, the, I think the thing, the problem that you have with the First Timothy scripture is that idea of some things being timeless while other things yeah um, not being yeah i really have an issue with 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 that like if if tim if paul is telling timothy these ladies with braided hair which you mm-hmm. have today gold on, which pearls. you have uh, <laughs> pearls all like Sorry. all these things these were like yeah that so clearly sets this passage in a very particular mm-hmm. context because that is how all of the temple prostitutes and the leaders of that local prostitution cult at the, the local mm-hmm. temple, it's so clearly that is the context being yeah. written about. Because nobody, even the most complementarian church mm-hmm. in the world today, has women with done-up hair, gold, pearls, nice clothing, and all that. Mm-hmm. None of them see verses 8 through 8 and 9. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they don't see any of that as timeless instruction. Mm-hmm. And then in the middle of that passage, they switch their exegesis to, now this is timeless. Yeah. And he goes, wow, like, yeah. why, why would you do that? Like, why would you do that? Um, in the middle of the passage, like, you don't have an issue saying that braids and gold and all that, that was all because that was outlawed in that area because of the temple called why would you not read those next two verses in the same exact way like Mm -hmm. like especially given the fact that paul is writing to timothy in the first place if you go and look at all of first timothy the whole thing is about how timothy needs to hold true uh, hold fast and true to what paul has passed on to him and to Mm -hmm. fight the false heresies and doctrines that are being taught in that church Mm -hmm. and for that church one of the things that needed to happen was an ex you know, to exclude the ladies coming out of this temple prostitution, coming out of where they were used to being in charge with their Mm -hmm. ideas, because there was already enough heresy going on in the church in the first place that Paul is trying to fight against old wives' tales and myths. This is what Paul tells Timothy later on in 1 Timothy. Mm -hmm. And then, like, he gets to this thing about Adam and Eve later on in this passage, and, and, like, for complementarians, they're like, see, that's the that is the nail in the coffin. Mm-hmm. It was Eve that screwed all the, all of this up in the first place. And so God is saying, don't let Eve be in charge of the church because she's going to screw it up. Mm-hmm. That's not actually the case. There was actually a first century heresy going on that Eve had been created before Adam. That was going around by the Gnostics. And so, again, within what Paul is talking about in regards to heresy and false teaching, he mentions this not not as a like, hey, women can't lead because they're easily led astray because they're, you know, that's not what's going on here whatsoever. And again, it's just, if you're going to interpret verses eight and nine about men raising their hands in prayer, not wearing gold, pearls, braids in your hair, expensive clothing, 
if that was all cultural, but now we're past that, mm -hmm. then why are we still interpreting the next two verses in that way? Yeah. Um, it just doesn't. Again, I'm not going to interpret the Bible in such a way with such high stakes in such a sloppy manner. Mm -hmm. If I was going to go and say, well, no, this is what Paul means in, in these verses, yeah. then, I, then, I would, then I would preach against hairdos and expensive clothes and gold and sure pearls. All the men were raising their hands Raise your, when they pray. All of that. I would <laughs> yeah. have to instill all of that yeah. because that's how you exegete a passage mm -hmm. is you have to do it consistently. Yeah. And you can't change it when it just seems really convenient for one group of people against another. Mm -hmm. It's just not that's just not good Bible work for me. Yeah. Um I, I can't come to that. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And then you talked about um just the way that Jesus interacted with women and that and that idea um also of how, you know, we have to also look at what Jesus says and what he did. Um and so we see the first woman or the first person, you know, to really be an yeah. evangelist is a female. Yeah, the word the word that's actually used for Mary Magdalene is the Greek word euangelia, which is where we get our word evangelist mm -hmm. because it's someone who pro proclaims the resurrection of mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah. And it's just a hard case for me to, like, it's a hard thing for me to overlook that the first person entrusted mm -hmm. with that message was a female, and then as the church was organizing, God goes, no, sorry. Right. They're not allowed to proclaim yeah. the gospel anymore. Yeah. That that just yeah. seems like a silly way of reading the Bible mm -hmm. to me, to go, well, well, he entrusted them. The, they were the first people. Yeah. When the men, like, like no, the, the it wasn't the men. Mm -hmm. It could have easily been the men. It wasn't. It was Mary Magdalene, and she was supposed to go back and tell those guys. Yes. What was going on? Yeah. And it's like, and then all of a sudden when the church gets organized, mm -hmm. it's like, you know what? Probably shouldn't do this anymore. Like, yeah. that yeah. just, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand that, that way of reading the Bible. Right. And I love it because she went back and told the men. And I think in second or first Timothy, like it says, don't let them teach men. And there's a lot of, I think complementarians who are okay with women teaching women yeah. but yeah. they're not okay with them teaching men because that's part of what it says but like she went back and proclaimed that to yeah men she did and and then like when you bring up like Aquila and priscilla mm -hmm. and i know in for, uh acts 18 they pull apollos to the side they did that together mm -hmm. but again the fact that they did it together is pretty telling of the role that priscilla had in the early church mm -hmm. Because if Priscilla was taking the complementarian view that she was supposed to sit down and shut up, right. she would not have been part of that conversation. Right. So clearly that's not how the early mm -hmm. church saw that. Mm -hmm. That's clearly not the practice of the early yeah. church for them to sit down and shut up mm -hmm. when they're at church. If not, it would have just been Aquila mm -hmm. in Acts 18 having that yeah. conversation. Yeah. So, again, between that, between Mary Magdalene being the one to go back and to tell mm -hmm. of the resurrection, you go, you just don't mm -hmm. see this prohibition against women speaking and leading throughout the whole of scripture. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, pretend though that first Corinthians 11, first Corinthians 14 and first Timothy two are not very difficult passages to make sense. Right. Of. I'm, I'm most egalitarians like, will just like, Oh yeah, whatever we got, we got better proof uh, whatever. No, listen, those are, those passages are very difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. If you want to become egalitarian, I think that we should just be more honest about the fact that those don't look good right. for our view. Yeah. Um, and you can, yes, you can come up with arguments all over the place for for it, but I, I would rather just be honest and say, listen, those three passages caused me a lot of problems as an egalitarian. However, I still firmly find myself planted in the egalitarian camp because of everything else I see throughout right. all of the scriptures. Um, mm -hmm. So so that's just where I land on it. Yeah, awesome. Well, again, remember that it's all about mutual respect and understanding. Hopefully, if this was your question, you did get some scripture to help you understand that, remembering that context is key, um, and remembering how to interpret passages in the same manner, in the same way 
And so um, if you did not hear that teaching, you can go back on this same channel, same podcast and watch that. But um, if you share that with others, again, just do it in such a way that you are respecting and loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. We hope that you have an amazing week. We will be right back here again next week as we dive deeper into um, where God was in my pain and suffering, right? And um, so maybe you need to invite somebody to watch or listen in for that next week. And again, if you have not subscribed or liked, be sure to do so. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Extra Point. Be sure to subscribe to the Southridge Church Podcast and tune in every Wednesday for another episode of The Extra Point.